Right, so thank you everybody for coming. Um, this is a teaching hosted by the Platypus Affiliate Society. So I'll just give a brief introduction of what Platypus is. Um, the Platypus Affiliate Society organizes reading groups, public forum, research, and journalism, focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old 1920s to 30s, new 1960s to 70s, and post political 1980s to 90s left for the possibilities of emancipatory, emancipatory politics today. So this teaching is hosted by our New Chicago chapter. Um, we host a reading group every uh, Sunday from 12.30 to 3 at Harper 125. Uh, you can find one of our posters or you can talk to me afterwards if you want like to attend. Um, we also host a coffee break, uh, which is like an informal discussion um, at Hutchinson Commons from 2.30 to 3.30 every, uh, every Friday. And we also uh, publish a, a monthly uh, open submission journal, the Platypus Review, which you can find at the back. And you can also find us online at platypus1917.org. Um, besides that, we also host uh, panels, and hopefully we're going to have one uh, on the anti-war movement coming next week on Thursday, uh, so keep an eye out for those posters. And of course, we also host teachers like this one um, on the Black Question that one of our senior members, Pam, will be presenting on, um, as well as next week, uh, another member, uh, James Vaughn, will be presenting on the American Revolution uh, teaching, so keep an eye out for that as well. Um, and I think uh, without further ado, uh, I'll let Pam present on the black question on the left from 1776 to uh, Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Thanks for waiting. So I, uh, my name is Pam Magalis. I teach at the university. I am one of the founding members of the Platypus Affiliate Society. Just to introduce it briefly, we, as Desmond said, we are a political education organization. So we try to learn both from the history of the left and the left today and how it takes up issues. So this teaching is particularly on the black question. And at first, when I had originally planned to give the teaching, um, I thought that I would do a kind of um, reprisal of some of my introductory remarks of the last summer reading group on the black question. So we do uh, reading groups and I introduced every week the new topic, the new issue on the history of the black question. But as I was working on it, I realized that it would be an opportunity to reflect on how platypus and the history of platypus has taken up, how we've taken up this question within our short history. Um, we were founding it in 2006 and um, things have changed since then. So I, I wanted to take it up as an opportunity to think through that history and how, um, what has changed since then and uh, in doing so, perhaps giving you a brief history of the present um, and on the Black question itself. So, so we have to begin uh, with the founding of the new SDS, so the new Students for Democratic Society that I was personally involved in and other members of Platypus were involved in. This was an effort across campuses in the United States. Um, we wanted to we wanted to have a 100 days campaign at the election of the new president. Um, this would have allowed us to raise issues that pointed beyond the pure electoralism. We wanted to use it as an opportunity to formulate an independent left position. And we thought that we would use the first 100 days of the new presidency to do so. Um, we wanted to, we emphasized that we wanted to find a left position outside of the Democratic Party and worried that the anti-war movement would basically collapse if it were all folded into the Democratic Party politics. We furiously campaigned for this effort within the new SDS. So Platypus linked up with others on the left, including members of the then humanist, Marxist humanist organization. We got wide support from the membership in Chicago. But it all ended quite unceremoniously at a Sbarro's on Cooper Union Square in Manhattan, where one of the leaders of the new SDS, Rachel Hott, um, shut down the effort. So what happened? Um, Obama had won the Democratic presidential nomination and the support for his presidency was surging, especially among new voters of my generation, the millennials, who were waxing poetic at the time about hope, change and progress. The three words that were paired at the time with Obama's image, which was part of the infamous poster that people saw everywhere. Um, the gamble worked and the leader of the new SDS at the time in New York, Rachel Hott, rejected the protest against what she understood as the first black president of the United States, the proper inheritor of the civil rights movement of MLK and of black power. For her, what it meant 
to stand against uh, Barack Obama behind uh, this black Democrat from Illinois to stand in opposition to him would be to be on the wrong side of history. So she, that's the way that she presented it. The new SDS was an inheritor of the civil rights movement um, and what it meant to be an inheritor of the civil rights movement for Rachel Hott and for the new SDS would be to stand behind Obama as the first black president of the United States. Important to notice also that some in the new SDS thought of him as an anti-war president, which was just patently false, um, given the fact that Obama was clear in his plan to increase the troops in Afghanistan. Perhaps his um, epidermally based appeal, as Adolf Freed Jr. would put it, had the bizarre effect of turning him into a representative of all values that millennial progressives held dear. Right? So he was transformed despite what he actually thought. Obama won and the anti-war movement crumbled because as it turned out, it had less to do with the war than getting the Republicans out of power, apparently. Down with the fascist Bush this time, that is not Trump because the left has been peddling this canard for a while now as a cudgel to vote for Democrats. So what did we expect? What did Platypus expect? Platypus expected um, that the election of Obama would clear the way by decentering the focus on identity-based politics. We thought that it would be a break from the black ethnic politics, which requires abstracting away from the many materially and personally meaningful experiences that black people share with others to condense around race as a singular concern. So we thought the presidency of Barack Obama presented an opportunity. After all, a black American had ascended to the presidency in the most powerful capitalist government on the globe. Surely this historic win would allow a reconsideration of what it meant to be on the left. Had we entered a post-racial America, people asked, where the politics of racial representation be replaced by a universal politics that could capture social discontent in new ways? Maybe, not so much. So what happened instead forms the backdrop of where we are today. Some social discontent among Black Americans rose in response to high unemployment under Obama, poverty, and police brutality, the excessive force of the executive arm of the state. So we often forget, but Black Lives Matter protests actually began under the second term of the Obama administration. So in 2012, Trayvon Martin was killed by George Zimmerman, a neighborhood watch volunteer, and the term Black Lives Matter was used for the first time by the organizer Alicia Garza in a 2013 Facebook post in response to Zimmerman's acquittal. In 2013, Patrice Cullors, Alicia Garza, and El Paul Tometi, who've recently been in the headlines because it's questionable what happens to these funds of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, they formed the Black Lives Matter Network with the mission to eradicate white supremacy, so quote, and to build local power to intervene in violence inflicted on black communities by the state and vigilantes, end quote. So the state. The distance from the Obama presidency at the helm of the state took on a conservative tone. The problem, we were told, was that actually Obama wasn't really black. He was not black enough. He was not authentically black. An entire ontology of blackness was reaffirmed. And instead of moving away from the politics of race, people doubled down on it. <clears throat> so where was this independent, independent perspective outside of the state in opposition to the leadership? There was a moment where it appeared that the opposition of that executive force of the state could be independent from the Democratic Party. Um, that is, what that means is that the Democratic Party was sitting at the helm, approvingly supervising those who wielded batons and fired their weapons, right? So it appeared that maybe there could be some kind of break. In the lead up to the 2016 election, there were stirrings that the kind of social discontent expressed in these protests would flare up once more. So after all, Hillary Clinton came with baggage at Charleston, South Carolina uh, protest. A protester went viral when she told Clinton, quote, I am not a super predator, Hillary Clinton, in response to the policies of mass incarceration, which she supported. In an article for The Nation, um, the author of the new Jim Pro, Michelle Alexander, um, titled Hillary Clinton does not deserve black people's vote. She wrote, it seems that we, Black people are her winning card, 
one that Hillary is eager to play, and it seems that we are eager to get played. Again, end quote. The article highlighted the Welfare Reform Act of 1996, um, the Criminal Reform Bill of 1996, which Biden led the efforts to pass. Um, it highlighted the ways in which he, uh, she, alongside President Clinton, who had been a political team, um, increased the militarization of at the border, and so on and so forth. So it seemed like at the time, the battle for the so-called black vote was on. At the time, the self-anointed Black Lives Matter activists were on Bernie Sanders for not declaring his opposition to what they understood as systemic racism. The former civil rights movement icon, John Lewis, the ex-SNCC leader and other prominent black functionaries denounced Sanders' call for social democratic politics as tone deaf about race. Some of them called it un-American. Um, some of this flared up at the moment in conversations across the left. Sanders' endorsement for Jesse Jackson for president in 1988. The Democratic Socialist of America back in the 1980s, also like Bernie Sanders, had endorsed Jesse Jackson's 1984 campaign for the Democratic nomination for president. The Jackson campaign had been a rallying point for the left at the time. This rainbow coalition that was led and organized originally by Fred Hampton from the Black Panther Party uh, became a kind of common platform for many discontents across left organizations. The main economic goal of Jackson's version of the organization was to have more minorities on the payrolls, in the boardrooms, and on the supplier lists of major corporations. The industries it most aggressively pursued were the financial sector on Wall Street, the telecommunications field, and the high-tech firms. This led back to the consolidation of Black leaders as managers of the Democratic Party, party ethnic constituency. Um, and so what I wanted to highlight here is that at the end of the day, both the Clinton and the Sanders parts of the, um, on the quote unquote uh, democratic left um, end up being reconciled, right? So Jackson himself was enthusiastic supporter for the campaign of Bill Clinton, who was seen as conceding to Reagan. So I guess this might be an opportunity to stop to consider the question of the black vote and what it means to fight for the quote unquote black vote. Like, what does it mean? The black vote and the black community seems to be a useful fiction of some sort. It papers over class divisions among black people by facilitating a politics of racial brokerage. Black nationalism had been a symptom of the failure of an earlier attempts at social democratic politics. A. Philip Randolph, Fannie Lou Hammer, Martin Luther King, Bayard Rustin, and the rest, who fought alongside the misleadership of the organized working class, which was once in the mid-20th century used to suppress social potential. They had warned, especially A. Philip, sorry, uh, Bayard Rustin had warned, that this new standpoint of the Black community would lead to simply the statement of a Black establishment, right? So a new Black establishment. As it turned out, he was right. Um, so there's a return of the conception of this kind of black representative politics is inherited through the new left in turns by ta Coates. And this is also uh, part of the second term of Barack Obama. There's a call for reparations in the pages of the Atlantic. Um, and it seemed to it's seen as a kind of revision of American history, which I think is the, the prehistory of the 1619 project. I think like these are of that same moment. Coates um, argues that he speaks for a certain population uh, for the black community. He's seen as a kind of black intellectual interpreter, interpreter specifically to white publics. Uh, but at the end of the day, he ends up releasing a kind of white guilt. Unemployment, poverty, police brutality. What is the cause? White people, white racism. 
Um, I was reflecting about this because in 2003, back when I was in high school, I used to watch um, the Chappelle show. I know if you guys know of the show with Dave Chappelle, and he had a skit on uh, reparations. And it was, it was a really great skit. So uh, reparations are passed in the United States and throughout America, black communities receive checks in the mail and there are reporters outside in the ghettos and they're like covering what's going on. And basically like people are lining up at liquor stores and they're celebrating like Cadillac sales go up, uh, diamonds and gold go up. And, you know, Dave Chappelle, he likes to be like a fly in the ointment. Um, and one of the reporters goes up to a guy in a big Newport truck and she's like, oh, are you going to quit your job as a truck driver? And he looks at her, he's like, no, I'm a, I'm a janitor. And she's like, well, what are you doing in this big truck? He's like, oh, I paid for this truck of cigarettes, cash money, like me and my family have cigarettes for life. And I guess what Chappelle was trying to get at, right, was the kind of uh, cheap bargain with current forms of inequality uh, among Black Americans, right, that you could just sort of buy, buy them off somehow. Um, the inadequacy of that kind of thinking. By the time that Tanya Hesse Coates was writing, however, this would have been inconceivable, offensive. But nonetheless, it was a kind of parody of, of justice. So then the apocalypse happened. Trump was elected, 2016, and the liberals were gobsmacked, flabbergasted, that he came into power in part by a big portion of the Black voters, of Black Americans. How could this happen? A battle ensues under Trump over the meaning of being an American throughout the Trump presidency. And this lays the groundwork for the return of BLM in the summer of 2020, which has now been transformed under Donald Trump, right? So it's no longer in protest of a Democrat in power, but appears to be in protest of a Republican. Um, there is, I think, uh, at least I think, a pretty appalling opportunism of turning the George Floyd protests um, to win back support for Democrats in office. Many people had by that time completely forgotten that BLM started under Obama. But I guess this part, this was in part helped by the fact that it had come down to his black authenticity, right? After all, it wasn't the case that the Democratic Party failed and that state brokerage failed and that um, capitalist society persisted, but Obama was simply not authentically black. And of course, neither was Donald Trump. So the problem seemed to continue. Maybe some thought the problem was America, actually. America was racist and the entire history of America was racist. And we had all somehow unconsciously repeated this racism in everything that we do. Enter the 1619 Project. So I think that what the 1619 Project presented was a fight, again, over the meaning of what it means to be American. It presented 1776, the American Revolution, as the true uh, origin, the counter-revolution, 1776, as Gerald Horn, who wrote for the Platypus Review, our monthly publication wrote, was the counter-revolution. And it raised this question for us in Platypus. Why should we consider, as leftists, are, are people uh, invested in history of the left, 1776 is a struggle for human emancipation. We uh, appear to be on an island of sorts and found ourselves with strange bedfellows, conservative voices that were clamoring against the New York Times. But we didn't have anything in common with them either on questions of capitalism and human freedom. And so it was an odd moment for Platypus, and some of us, um, including James Vaughn, uh, who will be speaking next week on the American Revolution, as well as I and others in the organization, led a series of lectures on the legacy of the American Revolution to sort of work through that, uh, those problematic questions that we had found were present on the left. It seemed to me at the time that the war over American history uh, presented an opportunity because it was an existential crisis of what it meant to be an American and what it meant to defend liberty. So potentially it could be an opportunity, maybe, maybe. Um, we defended the idea that America was the revolution, that America was 
an idea yet to be fully realized. Uh, this is James's uh, conception in the lecture, in the final lecture. That idea of America, in essence, is that people individually and collectively should be able to freely determine the course of their own lives, to do things together that they could not achieve on their own, right, through association, and that the United States as a political entity was simply a framework for allowing the development of people, both individually and together. It had no inherent geographic and certainly no ethno-national boundaries whatsoever. Instead, what we found was a renewed call for, can't really call it anything else, but secession, a kind of increased conversation about the imminent civil war, and even um, a kind of perverse satisfaction in the idea that Trump voters might secede from the rest of the country. So calls for secession were the ways in which people dealt with the impacts in American politics. Um, I thought that it was useful to return to some of the ways that the radical abolitionists dealt with the calls of disunity, for disunity among the abolitionists themselves. And at the time, in the closing of our American Revolutionary Lectures, I uh, quoted from the radical uh, Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner, um, who goes on to become part of the Republican Party, who at the time had an argument with Wendell Phillips, who supported disunion at the time. And this is what Sumner said to Phillips, which maybe we can take some words from uh, today. And I repeated this a couple of times and I'll just keep repeating it because I think it's helpful. He said to Phillips, take your place among citizens. These are the weapons of a citizen in this just warfare. You already support the constitution of the United States by continuing to live under its jurisdiction right? We are all here. You receive its protection and owe it a correspondent allegiance. In simply refusing to vote or to hold office, you proceed only halfway under your own theory. You should withdraw entirely from the jurisdiction. You should sever that great vivis cable of allegiance, not content yourself with cutting and snipping at the humbler cords by which some of your relations to the constitution are regulated. But what new home will you seek? Where in the uttermost parts of the sea should you find a spot which is not desecrated by the bad passions of men embodied in acts and forces of government? So in closing, coming out of that lectures and the Black Question uh, reading group, how do we think about this today? Contemporary forms of unfreedom are not propelled today by the need to subjugate black labor to the interest of Southern planters and industrialists, but rather what they are, are a means of managing a growing class of Americans who are not exclusively black, but have been made obsolete by hyper-industrialization, large scale introduction of automation, cybernetic command, just in time production, and other strategies of flexible accumulation in US farms and factories. They have been rendered superfluous and have joined the ranks of the Industrial Reserve Army. Racist divisions among the working class help to reconcile people to this capitalist reality. In retrospect, race as a form of ideology now functions as a reason for this form of unfreedom, right? So it's flipped. We continue to reach for old modes of analysis in the face of a changed world. Today, Blackness is still derogated, but anti-Black racism is not the principal determinant of material conditions and economic mobility for many Black Americans. Rent, food on the table, their children's education, safety of their neighborhoods, etc. That's the daily concerns. Social exclusion and labor exploitation are different problems, but they are nevertheless discon disconnected in capitalism. Sorry, they are never disconnected in capitalism. Both processes work to the advantage of capital, but let's not get it twisted. Segmented labor markets, ethnic rivalry, racism, sexism, xenophobia, all work against building a working class, a united labor movement and independent political power. That's its function. The exclusion is often deployed to advance exploitation on terms that are, all, that are most favorable to the ruling class. The so-called short-term gains, psychological or otherwise, mask the fundamental disadvantages to the independence of labor. 
Those who are most impoverished and dispossessed, the hyper-exploited, place downward pressure in wages, worsening conditions, and undermining the power of labor in specific sectors and throughout society. Today's anti-racist politics further isolates the conditions of the most excluded segment of workers, separating their experiences from other workers and their labor from the broader social processes at work, instead of emphasizing the empirical and potential political unity of the labor class, which would have to go beyond those racial divisions. What this results then is that racial politics is a way of managing the discontent of the powerless in a way that further disempowers them under the guise of racial justice. So it screws with people, telling them that the game is rigged against them and points to the white workers as the cause. Done. Contemporary anti-racism hinges on the premise that race or racism continues to determine the political, social, and economic circumstances of Black people, much as it did at the turn of the 20th century, or even earlier under slavery, or even earlier for Horn since the 11th century, or even earlier for ta Coates. Transhistorical, unchanging racism, an ontological force which white people are either committed to, driven by, or both unconsciously, right? You don't know it, but you too are racist. You too are guilty. That force then urges them to engage in what he calls the plunder of black bodies. This is the singular explanation of disadvantage, inequality, or injustice experienced by black Americans. ta Coates, of course, was a Hillary supporter. The Black question, I think, is historically specific. There is no such thing as an eternal racist human nature, no such thing as an ontology of blackness or whiteness, but what there are are social relations specific to the time that we live in. There are forces of production and the balances of political power, and then there's the consciousness of the left or lack thereof of those problems. There is society and its pathological expressions and how we pose the problem of these, patholo- of these pathologies and the problem of society will impact how we formulate the possibility of a solution. So not the solution, the possibility of even considering a solution. So I say, take your place among citizens, that these are the weapons in a just warfare, but maybe those who will fight alongside you have not yet arrived. Maybe we need to make room for new ways of thinking about these problems rather than repeating what's already there. But today the left is dead. May we not lie to ourselves about the state of the corpse so that we may be able to think again anew. Long live the left. That's it. Um, should we open up for yeah, so, conversation? Uh, now we have a question of the day. So yeah, if people are free to like, ask the questions you have, uh, the teacher, they think they were confused about, or you have like or disagree more about the library role. There are no thought taboos. Yeah. So one, <clears throat> so just from listening to this, um, yeah. I certainly agree with the gist that there needs to be a universalist politics that that uses class as a way to unite white and black workers. But I am a bit curious um, with that quote that you brought up in the 1860s and kind of about the redemption of America. It, it seems to me that in the history, like the actual history of black engagement, the radical working class movement, that there seems to be a real tension between black autonomy and um, a sort of patient, like a, a socialism that uh, attempts to recuperate the American project as opposed to reject it. So, for instance, in the, in the 1930s, um, sort of the height of black engagement with the Communist Party during the third period, when they explicitly like endorsed a pan-Africanist republic of New Africa as an independent state. Um, and while the reasons, while it's not simply as complex as like direct as the Communist Party had this ideology and then all the black people joined it, there was a, a real sense, there was a real drop in black membership and black um, engagement with the Communist Party as they moved into the popular front. And, and towards a sort of um, Americanism as the 20th century socialism thing. And so I just kind of wondered, like, 
I, I don't think that animosity towards the United States has sort of an idea. It's something that is composed on black people that is like created by the bourgeois or by liberal intellectuals. And thus I wonder how can a left-wing project that attempts to embrace it, uh, embrace America as a liberatory concept deal with that fundamental history of like oppression. Okay, there seemed to be two questions there. One was about like oppression, but the other one, which I thought was maybe we could tackle first was like yeah. on the history of the left and its response to like black autonomy. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that we discussed in the black question reading group over the summer, um, we read texts of the third period. Uh, we talked about the history of the CIO and the debates over whether or not black people constituted their own nation. Um, and so what was embraced by the American communists in this period was uh, a kind of black separation from the rest of the nation. And there were serious debates with people, including black Americans who stood against the position, right? And so, um, because that's a matter, I guess, of political consciousness. And the argument, it seemed to me to be most persuasive was that in fact, Black Americans were some of the most American uh, parts of the working class. Um, they're not only because their labor constituted a great part of what made America like a wealthy capitalist uh, nation, but also because their history, given that they were extricated from these other cultural histories, became fundamentally American. Um, I think that what's important to note is that if the segregation of Black Americans in the South presented a problem for how you organize labor, I think that some of those debates arose, it seems, dealing with that obstacle and whether or not you'd have to create independent Black institutions that would somehow be connected to the party at a higher level. So I think that that debate as to whether or not Black Americans constitute a nation in and of itself is bound up with the political considerations of what to do about a segregated United States. Um, I, I forget if you ask, like, what do we do about that or what's like... I, I guess yeah. when you're, to clarify, yeah. in the ideal building of a new left of a new working class party, there, there is going to be a fundamental... I, I would argue that there is a fundamental tension between... Um, a sort of open pro-Americanness and pushing for Black liberation. And I think there would be a, a tension there ideologically. I guess my main question is, mm -hmm. is if you're pushing for a universalizing project, but the world you live in is not one that fundamentally recognizes a, a where class is not as flat as we would like it to be. I wonder how do you integrate Black liberation perspectives into a, a, a wider working class movement without either marginalizing those perspectives or kind of supporting. Okay, well, I'll give you like more of a straight answer. I think that socialists, insofar as people are interested in building like an independent working class movement in the United States, we need to call out racial ideology for what it is, a form of ideology that divides the working class. Mm -hmm. And that would mean, uh, you know, when you call it a universal project, I mean, it's like a project that needs to unite the working class on the basis of their, their power, their power, can only be taken up if they are identified as a working class and see their own power as workers rather than as white people or as black people. Mm -hmm. um, and so it would need, it would require a kind of breaking down of affirmative conceptions of race. I would say, yeah. Um, why would you say that um, racial ideology um, has a heel in the United States among like, um, I, like as as I don't know your name, sorry, but as you as you're just saying, yeah. a lot of a lot of black people um, would probably agree with that means for us and like the way that this blood changes for some reason. I mean, just to be clear, I think that that perspective of Coates is mostly like a educated middle class perspective, very urban in character. Um, I went to school, so I, I'm originally from Peru, and then I moved to Michigan. I lived in Michigan um, my entire middle school and high school. And um, working class Black Americans in Michigan, at least, were 
super patriotic would celebrate 4th of July with their children. I don't know, but what it meant to them, right? It's not this conception of like a racist white America, but what it meant to be an American was to stand for things like freedom and liberty, like to be able to uphold their, their jobs. And they often had a lot of critique of the governments. I mean, it wasn't just to stand for the American government or something, but I guess I questioned the idea that somehow, um, these uh, this call for reparations by Tani Hassey Coates is representative of the majority of Black Americans. I think that that's what it's supposed to look like, right? Like the Black intellectual that the government or the people in power appeal to try to figure out like, what are Black people thinking? Like, why didn't you tell us, right? Like, tell us. Well, okay. Um, then I guess the, the question that I wanted to ask is like, why would this uh, ideology that race tables be able to mobilize Black people? When you um, say I, mobilize black people, what do you mean? Um, like bring them into the Democratic Party. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the kind of brokerage politics of the Democratic Party, where things are broken down into ethnic constituencies, are a way in which social discontent is managed so that um, there is actual social discontent. People do have real concerns about police brutality, poverty, unemployment, and devastation in their communities and in their neighborhoods. Where that energy goes uh, is up to the left. And right now there is no left. And so the management of that social discontent has to be taken up by people who are in power, who are organized, and the people that are winning at that game are the Democratic Party. So they both have to appeal and recognize the social discontent while actively leading government in such a way that doesn't address those problems, I, I would say. Um, but this, it seems, has happened for quite a long time. And maybe, I don't know if it's, I don't think that it's a forever thing, right? I think it's, you know, it's managing social discontent, but perhaps there's a different way of thinking about how to deal with that social potential where people are unsatisfied, like maybe there's something else. Yeah. Um, I would just like to add on to what Ben said. Um, I noticed in your teaching um, or in your presentation, you didn't actually mention the 2020 protests all that much. Um, I, I know you didn't mention it, but it, it wasn't, um, you know, wasn't the main focus. But of course, a lot of people would view the 2020 protests as like an affirmation of how much like racial ideology, so to speak, does like capture black people or like the American population at large. So I'm not sure what you think of that. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I have a second question, but I, I think, yeah, I, I won't say I won't say my questions. Uh, yeah, so I mentioned the 2020 protests in the following way. I said that there is a kind of amnesia that in fact the Black Lives Matter movement started under Obama. When it happened under uh, Trump, they seem to have a different political character. Um, we hosted a series of panels around that time on police brutality. And I thought that those were really useful because things seem to have become conflated. The issue of the excessive force of the state um, and the problem of racial divisions had become conflated in one. So much so that in Baltimore, um, where six officers were charged um, after Freddie Gay was killed, um, two of those officers, no, I'm sorry, three of those officers were black. The left didn't know quite what to do with that. And so it sort of papered over that to fit like an understanding of police brutality as an expression of white supremacy. Um, but there I thought that there would have been an opportunity to clarify such problems. And in the police brutality series that we held, we had um, August Nimtz, I believe, and Adolf Freed, who talked about the kind of work among uh, black neighborhoods that they used to do um, when it came to issues of Black brutality, police brutality. And part of that was to develop civil society organizations, self-defense leagues that um, would take up the roles that the police supposedly did for Black communities. 
And that sounded to me as a fundamentally, and maybe I'm sort of simplifying it, they said a lot more, and you should look at those recordings, but that seemed to me to point to a very different type of politics than thinking of police brutality as expressions of white supremacy. Because then you had to have a conception of the state and its executive force. And that is not a matter of white supremacy. Yeah. Can it be both? Like something can be an expression of the state's domination over the segment as the committee of the movement class, but also as a racialized component. Like, so are the three cops white supremacists, the black cops? I would say that they're participating in a white supremacist institution, yes. I wouldn't say that they're personally white supremacists, but that's not important. Like they're important, the actual beliefs in their heart doesn't matter. The function of the police as a way to maintain order in, in poor black areas across the United States is a white supremacist function. Um, well, you know, one of the things that came up, because I, this was like a time where people were flinging statistics at each other about like, it was really abject. It was like, you know, who was killed more versus who was killed less, like it was sub-political. Like it wasn't about politics. It was about like death and numbers. Um, but at the time, I remember that one of the things that was brought up was that there were, it was a, a pretty high death rate in poor white neighborhoods as well. Um, and I guess my question is, in trying to organize working people um, independently from the state, how we understand that executive force seems to be at issue, less so the personal psychology of officers who might be recruited onto those institutions for whatever racial perspectives they may or may not have. It seems like an instrument, it seems instrumental to organize people on the basis of how power is constituted and what the police is vis-a-vis -vis the possibility for an independent working class movement, rather than pointing out the personal psychology of individuals who but may or may I'm not, not be part of the police the force. Psychology of one individual within the police or the other, I'm talking about the social function as related to race, like as the police is an institution. There's a history of the police as descended from slave catchers in the United States. There's a history of the police as, as crushing mainly black working class uprisings across the United States and lots and Los Angeles and Detroit, like I think the the idea that that the police you can neatly separate because certain members of the police are black and because some white people get killed in the police that you can neatly separate it into the state violence category and the white supremacy category. I think it's it's simplifying a much deeper sort of connection between the two. Like the problem is it's not individuals; it's a systemic thing that. I think fundamentally exists that the state that the state uses the police yes as an arm to throw you out whether or not you're white or black from your apartment if you don't pay rent, but it also acts as an institution to cruise around in poor black neighborhoods to keep people afraid to to fly helicopters at like one in the morning over South Central Los Angeles all the time, like to maintain a sort of psychological domination that allows to that allows the separation of the black working class from the white. But that is still white supremacy. It's just white supremacy as an arm of capitalist exploitation. Like they don't, I don't know, it just feels like we've had oh, okay. a lot of discussion about the black people's role in the Democratic Party and, and what that role should be, and a lot of discussion about that sort of relationship since the 60s. But we haven't really talked about, you know, if we're talking about black people in and out of the left. There's a rich history of black independent working class organization, organization within working class parties that include white people. And mm -hmm. all the like the scholarships perpetually in the past 20 years have moved away from like a vulgar Marxist understanding of like it's just class and then race is a subcomponent, and more as a, towards a nuanced understanding of class and race in relation with each other. Yeah. What you didn't hear from me, I have three parts here to your long question. What you didn't hear from me is an assertion of class over race. I think that's a canard. I think that like when Sanders was running, you know, there was this like Sanders is for class and then like other people are for race. Mm -hmm. And that just ended up uh, like people were really positively embracing that, mm -hmm. right? Like Bernie bros were like, yeah, like, we're just about class, you know? Um, and I think that that is a problem. Like the issue is capitalist society and yeah. social relations. And how we think about that versus, you know, actually the real issue is like the workers versus like the people that are um, expressing discontent with racism. 
I would say, though, that I fundamentally disagree with this idea that the police is just an institution that can be um, that's a kind of continuation of the slave catchers like this, this kind of historical um, narrative. Uh, the police, as we know it now, really comes into being at the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century in response to labor struggles, in response to strikes and the kind of consolidation of a professional force of the police has to do with that class conflict arriving in the United States, um, which wasn't just white, right? But nonetheless, um, I think though, that what's deeper here, it's this idea that white supremacy is something that we need to um, present as like the real boogeyman. And I guess I am rejecting it because on the basis of being somebody who tries to understand what it would take to organize people for an independent working class movement in the United States, one has to understand how power is constructed, how is it organized and how ideology functions. It seems to me that how ideology functions on the issues of white supremacy is rather amorphous. And as a historian, what I understand to be like a pretty key moment in the development of this conception on the left is in the United States during the 1970s, after there was this discontent with what the new left led to, as to there was this inability to actually organize a revolutionary movement in the United States. Um, several people who had been part of progressive labor, ex-Stalinists who left the, new, the, the, the students for democratic uh, uh, Students for Democratic Society um, presented a new thesis um, uh, through a little pamphlet called The White Blind Spot. It presented a kind of proto history of whiteness and has since then been codified in the Academy as whiteness studies. Now, like people will like dedicate serious resources to this. It's interesting that when you read some of the major works of like this whiteness studies um, uh, historians, what you get is this frustration that Reagan won. They're like, why is it that even though all of these working class people like suffered as a result of these terrible like right wingers in America, they still voted for Reagan. And it's this kind of helplessness about how to politically organize people that then leads them to this conclusion, which I think is incorrect, that the reason why these working people voted for Reagan is because white supremacy persists. It just persists in new forms. And I think it does a disservice to us trying to organize working people. It also does a disservice for organizing white workers who would need to be won over on the basis of their common plight with workers of all colors, nationalities, ethnicities, and backgrounds. So if you want to organize an independent working class movement and you're accusing workers of being racists, then it's a problem, isn't it? I went to um, a Jacobin event many years ago in Brooklyn. And I remember this was like, I was getting like extremely frustrated with this kind of discourse on the left, which seems to like never go away. But one of the things that came up was should these these people were supporting kind of social democratic policies. Right. So and they thought that like Sanders would help to advance that. And they were like, well, OK, well, like, who should benefit from these social democratic politics? And the people on the panel were like, well, not the racists. And I was like, what does that even mean? What does that mean? Like, so you want to allocate state resources, but exclude the racists? So should racists not get hired? And yeah, that is what they thought. And it's, it just really confuses things, doesn't it? Because at the end of the day, you'd want to break that kind of obstacle to organizing people. You'd want to call it what it is, a form of ideology and not give it a pseudo reality that is transhistorical, that like stops people from thinking of themselves as a common working class. You'd have to break it up. You'd have to challenge it. You have to do away with it. Yeah. So I have one last comment. I know I've talked a lot so far. Yeah, go ahead. I'll just be, I'll be clear. So I'm a, I'm co-chair of my ESA here. 
And I'm also I specialize in the history of African American communists, like this what I wrote my master thesis on, uh, specifically black organizing in the 1930s. And so I'm like really big on literature about this. Um, and I guess one thing that I'm super kind of like we've all heard the sort of like racism factory discourse, right? Like the whole idea that the white that this. I, I I certainly agree with you that that there has been an attempted product to make race a transhistorical reality in the same ways as class, in order to obfuscate class as one of the main ways that people um, modulate their opposition against the state. However, I do think that to go completely in the other direction and to kind of deny the reality of well, not deny like for instance, what you said was they. With the election of Reagan, and I think that's a good example, the election of Reagan in 1980, uh, a lot of these people who were formerly the new left were looking at it and said, okay, you got elected because all these white people were racist. Yeah. And what we need to do is uh, tackle anti racism instead of, instead of a cost analysis. And what you said there, I think that is a flawed conclusion. But I think another, another thing that you said was the, the idea that white supremacy just incarnated in a new form. Um, and you disagreed with that. And I think that it did. I just don't think that that is a specifically like working class phenomenon. I think white supremacy is a weapon that the capitalist class uses on the working class to keep them in line. I think it has been successful at certain points in destroying the ability of the working class to organize and work together. And I don't think it's productive to go to working class neighborhoods and be like, you guys are all racist and need to go to my, my diversity training. But, but I do think it's productive to go into working class neighborhoods. And if there is an obvious false consciousness that has been planted where, oh, these immigrant workers are going to take my job. Oh, they're gonna, there is a, um, oh, they're gonna hire us and uh, they're gonna fire us and hire a bunch of black people for less wages, but uh, like casual, like racist slur, stuff like that, where you don't need to be like a soul, but I do think you need to, we, we as the left, if, if the left is dead and we're trying to rebuild it, we have to be honest about the conditions that we're operating in. And we don't exist in conditions where racism doesn't exist. Like I'm, I'm from Kentucky, personally, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I spent most of my undergrad at Bowling Green, Kentucky. It was the former Confederate capital of that state. And uh, a lot of the work that I did there was our YDSA supported the UAW workers working work strike there. And I've seen like how powerful um, working class alliances can be to overcome race. But I've also seen the ability of um, in that same place, they were essentially saying to them, hey, uh, we're going to close down this plant and move to Mexico if you guys don't stop striking. And suddenly it was an argument about, oh, these damn Mexicans who are going to, who are going to be hired for so much less of a problem and not our bosses who are going to be closing down this plant. And I think we have to like reckon with that and come up with a universalist project that doesn't deny the, that doesn't deny the existence of race or try to build a build a colorblind left from the beginning because we don't exist in a colorblind world. Like, you have to deal with race and then you can move to abolishing it. Like, you can't just go, I don't know. I, I think that's been my experience, at least with my organization. So when the Communist Party organized the Sharecroppers Union in the South, surely it had to deal with a lot of racists, don't you think? Yeah. And the way that it organized them was on the basis that they have a common power if they unite with black sharecroppers. I think that's the kind of work that's necessary. Yeah. And I don't think that means sort of telling people like you're not experiencing forms of racism. But the question is, what do leftists do? How do they approach? Because the second thing I was going to say is that certainly I don't disagree that all kinds of biases, sexism, xenophobia could be used to advance the interests of the ruling class. So can black pride, as we've seen, right? Like that's what this has been about. Like our like our moment is about that. Like everyone is like a proud defendant of the race, capitalists, the ruling class, and that is also the state management of impoverished people. And it disempowers them. And so I just think that that form of ideology is also something that leftists would have to critique because it divides the working class and it sells people a cheap a cheap way of reconciling themselves to the ruling class um the black establishment right as bayard rustin warned us like that's also part of the left that's also something we should remember um 
because at the end of the day, you know, there's their workers, but they don't constitute a class for themselves yet, right? There are people that work and then the left would have to be involved in constituting them as a class, as a self-conscious force in society. And that hasn't happened. It's not happening right now. So how we do that has to, has to be on the basis of unity, um, of working class politics, of constituting a working class politics. So yeah, I mean, people should read about the Communist Party in the 1930s because working in the South in the 1930s surely meant dealing with a lot of people that had a lot of biases. Now, our problem now, which may be a little bit different than the Communist Party in the 1930s, is that we have to deal with people who supposedly represent the Black community in their interests on the basis of racial pride who are selling out the working class, right? Like, that's our problem now. It's very common all the time. Yeah. Um, actually, I also want to talk about this subject of uh, universalism, because um, let's say we're the temporary left. There is this, like, like you mentioned, the class versus race thing, mm -hmm. and you would say that like, someone like Sanders uh, would supposedly represent universalism contra the um, identity politics, particularism of uh, Hillary Clinton, for instance, right? Um, but yet you see the counter that with um, Jesse Jackson, for example. Um, I'm not sure if you want to elaborate more on that. Like this, this, like this, like um, desire for universalism on the left. It's like making a return now, I feel. Um, yeah, it seems insufficient. I don't know if you want to speak more on that. Um, I mean, I think that what Sanders represents is a kind of um, return to social dem democracy, right? Um, so insofar as like social democratic politics have a universal dimension, then I think that's, that's what he represents. And in part, I think, it's because of the crack up within the Democratic Party. I mean, maybe others can say more. Like, it seems to me that there is a crack up of this attempt to manage, right, the social discontents of people on the basis of this ethnic communities, that, that there is a kind of crack up about it, which is why the Democrats had to, like, support all kinds of uh, violent uh, attempts against the, the police actually, like in Minneapolis, like they had to say like, we're with them, right? And that was strange. It was like, oh, like they're with them because they need them to support them. But then they themselves are, they're, they're the boss of the police. So, so it just, it turns into this like problematic way of upholding that democratic leadership. And Sanders seems to be pointing out that there needs to be a shift kind of you know, towards social democratic policies. Um, I, I don't think that doing it through the Democratic Party is going to be successful, but maybe that's neither here nor there. Um, I think there's just been like an influx of Democratic Party supporters as a result of the Bernie campaign. And like, I'm like a bitter millennial, right? Because I was there in 2008 when this happened with Obama, where like our independent organizations that were attempting to move beyond electoralism crumbled because we all had to vote for the first black president. Not me, of course, but you know. And so it's now the fact that it's happening through Bernie Sanders, it's sort of like first is tragedy, second time is farce. So, that's what I think about the universalism of the Bernie Sanders campaign. Yeah. Hi. Um, I am wondering if the more recent development of unions yeah. um, in academia and now at Amazon um, offers any hope in your perspective because it, it does feel like it has some momentum and um, the strategies. Yeah, I don't know, could you, it's very contemporary, but. When you say academia, what are you thinking about? You mean like the unionizing efforts among, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I have been following some of the developments in Amazon and it seems interesting that like there seems to be an effort to organize outside of the established unions. And I'm curious to see where that goes, however, and as, 
it seems to me that the unions have this incredible amount of resources. Um, when I was part of the union efforts at NYU, we were connected to the UAW without which it was really difficult to imagine how we would have been able to pay for things like legal advice and lawyers. I mean, that's just like an entire kind of institutional support that is difficult to imagine. I, you know, as far as like hopeful, <laughs> like whether or not like hopeful uh, is something to be, I, I, I keep a close eye on things. I don't think that it's about um, losing some kind of hope or like being hopeful or being optimistic about like the current. I think that we just have to be honest like my, my concern is that sometimes the left lies to itself because it wishes things were otherwise, but in doing so, they get more confused about what's actually happening. And so I, I don't know, I wish them well. And I, you know, to the extent that it's possible for them to organize outside of the existing institutional um, labor bureaucracy, I think it would require an independent uh, political party to help those efforts. And to the extent that the energy of the millennial left is driven back, has been driven back into the Democratic Party, I do find myself uh, not entirely optimistic about that. Uh, yeah. Or, uh, what's that hand? Yeah, yeah, I was just trying to say about the unionization. I don't know about the efforts in the workplace, but in terms of Efforts at university that I see. Yeah. I go to the university and get a grant. Yeah. But all these issues that we're discussing are there, maybe, maybe even more prominent because, like, graduate student unions, the graduate students are very into identity So, the junior and Western became much more uh, prompted uh, to use much more racial language for the like BLM. And, and yeah, there are a lot of demands there and seem to. There are contradictions because some demands are for more diversity administrators and stuff. And is that necessary? Is that necessary? The working class in a way, or, or I mean, it seems that uh, there are bigger issues that are for that that section, and is it is it is it always there some gain that they fall into it by advocating for some groups more than others, and yeah. uh, if we were thinking a lot about some of the demands, uh, there can be issues. Like I don't think there is. A, the interests of all the students uh, by people. So yeah, there are, so there, there are very different what you said about the term of the races, uh, as you know, races workers, for example. Uh, yes, yeah, so yeah, so I'm not optimistic about the labor networks at the, the university in, in the sense that it's, I mean, the same problems we care, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, back to the subject of universal work. You know, it strikes me that like a lot of universalism today is upheld by non-leftists, right? Liberals, um, Compact, right? Which is a new magazine, a spike, obviously. Um, you have like John McWhorter, this guy, yeah. and that sort of guy. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure exactly what my question is, but then they're, they're, they're like also uh, arguing for like a universalism, like anti wokeism actually, probably more accurate. It's more like anti identity politics, right? Um, yeah, I'm not sure what you would make of that. Um, because I feel like a temptation on like the left is just to say, like, oh, yeah, um, yeah, we should be universalist, but it's it's not it's not so clear what that actually means, right? Like there are many liberals who are universalists. Um, I don't know. Uh, I want to ask some questions. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think I I don't know either, but I think that we're going through a period of political realignment, so that um, 
people that may have considered themselves to be on the, you know, like in, in American political terms, right? Like, I don't think that the Democrats are on the left, just to be clear, but like people that would have aligned themselves like to be like with the Democratic Party are now much more open to either being like independent voters or even Republican Party supporters. And I mean, there is this shift that we're undergoing. And I guess that is why it's especially important not to just repeat what's already out there, but try to think these questions anew. I, I think cracking down or I also worry about like the intense like anti-wokeism as a way of not thinking though. So it, it seems like it's, a, it's an easy way of sort of denouncing the enemy, but it's a lot of smoke. Like, you know, um, the, the question would be like how to think about these problems in a way that help us understand the source of that social discontent, not just to say, well, it's not that, bro, you know? Um, and, but it is a lot of noise. I mean, I think that especially somebody like us, we're in academia, like it's a pretty dominant discourse and it can get in the way of us being able to think. And so I think people's like emotional response against it is because it takes up a lot of room. It takes up a lot of space. And it seems to have been, because it's become institutional and codified, it also means that it takes up a lot of space in the minds of very young people who are like coming into the universities and maybe could think otherwise. And I don't know, I feel like it becomes the way of being part of the discourse in universities. You have to accept certain social, um, you have to accept certain thought taboos and in order to participate in a conversation and so that part, I think I understand why people are fully rejecting it. But I also think that in fully rejecting it, like what's going to take its place? And in that, I think the situation is a bit mo more murky. Is that a hand? Yeah. Can I no, that's it. Yeah. Could you just make a comment on this? Yeah. Um, which please. Is like, obviously, universalism, as a, you know, we're talking about, it's like obviously a. a it's also like I want to talk about the other half of it strategically, which is that like it's also a practical necessity because capitalism is universal. So that is to say, capitalism can exist with illegal apartheid, racially segmented society, South Africa, pre-1965 United States, and it can exist without any of that stuff whatsoever. And so I think Pam's point about needing to kill people's laborers is essential because going in the neighborhoods by working class neighborhoods and finding the child anti-immigrant rhetoric, you and if you come to a strategy with that about just using their racism, the point is that exact rhetoric exists in Black working class, Hispanic working class, Mexican and Korean working class neighborhoods in the United States. So those strategies simply will fail. I mean, you have to speak to them as laborers and their interests as laborers. I mean, that would be the spirit of comment. I mean, capitalism is ruthlessly universalized. It can exist without any of this stuff. And it will exist beyond all of this stuff, um, proving itself again and again it's really capable of doing that. So I think that universalism is also a necessity of practice. It's a practical necessity. It's not something like choice, if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't know. I also um, should probably wrap up soon, but I also just think that um, like I'm an immigrant and I came to this country with, I think, a very similar idea of how like working class, like illegal immigrants come to this country with this like belief that the United States is a place where your labor can advance your hopes. And then in the disappointment of that in like actual social reality, the question is what do you do with that desiderata? What do you do with that like imagination about like what that opening was supposed to be about? You could tell those working class immigrants, well, it's all a lie and they lied to you, it's fake. Or you could say, well, maybe it's, you know, a yet to be redeemed potential. And that's why you need a left. And that's what you need to organize on the basis of your labor. And I think that's a much better response that to me speaks to the history of the left. Um, you know, not to say like it's a ruse. They're lying to you. The people at the top, they're manipulating you, but rather to say, well, it's right that you had these hopes and dreams because, right? Because free labor is supposed to help you advance in the world. That's what we all hope for. And we shouldn't tell people that that's a lie. We should just say, well, maybe we live in a world in which that's not possible, but that's why a left ought to exist. And what's, that's why an independent working class movement ought to exist. 
Um, but you do that on the basis of that hopefulness and that possibility and those horizons, rather than to tell them that, you know, they've just internalized white supremacy, um, which I don't think goes anywhere. And I think it's fundamentally deflating and takes away any kind of possibility um, that they have in their own ideas of labor and freedom. So I think we should build on that rather than, you know, hand wave it away as racism. So that's what I think should happen anyway. Thank you very much for coming. For